Victory Hour podcast is made possible with our partner WUPI 92.1 FM, The Owl, Umpy, and Presque Isle's number one hit music station. Welcome to the show, History Buffs, a friend of history, and hello to you from whatever place you're listening to us today. This is Evan, Chris, Bethany, and Caleb, your hosts. Hello. hello. What's up? We're all members of the University of Maine Presque Isle History Club, and we are broadcasting from the WUPI 92.1 FM Presque Isle. On this episode of our podcast series, we will be discovering and learning about the story of Vlad the Impaler. And at the end, we will try to answer the question of tyrant or hero. Are you guys ready to travel to Romania? Not really. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Let us be off to Valachia. <laughs> so, uh, let's begin this conversation with uh, describing and uh, telling the story of uh, Vlad the Impaler. Why did he get his name and uh, all the fascinating, gruesome, but mostly violent stories that go with his life? Those are synonyms. (laughs) Exactly, especially when you talk about Vlad. (laughs) (laughs) Very true. So when we think about Vlad the Impaler, we are reminded of one of the most savage and and barbaric leaders of all time. So his name is Vlad Tepes, and um, he's responsible for creating the amazing story about the forest of impaled bodies, and that he even, you know, drank the blood of his enemies, and there's, you know, there's so much more that he is uh, set to do. So to some, he is the very embodiment of evil and the representation of devil, while to others, he's a proud defender of faith, courageously standing against the Ottoman Empire that is trying to get over his land, you know? They're trying to get his land, he's defending them for the people that are from his country and that get they don't... Property. <laughs> exactly. And that they don't like the Ottoman Empire, he's their hero. So... He got his name, Vlad the Impaler, his name is Vlad Tepes, by his favorite method of execution. Can you guess, kids? Uh, I'm going to guess um, impaling, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> you mean what is impaling? <laughs> Fair point. We're not going to go through that. <laughs> we hope our audience and we hope you guys know what impaling go is. Go through that? Do not go through the <laughs> impaling <laughs> process, no. We're not going to talk no. about it. <laughs> well, we kind of have to. We're not going through okay. the impaling process. We are not going through the impaling process. Just don't experience it. I'm, I'm I don't want to do you know the impaling. Anyone, has anyone ever experienced it and lived, Evan? Well. How would we... How, what? Do you have a story about that? Olaf does. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because it sounds like okay. you do. In Frozen, remember the scene where Olaf goes, oh, I've been impaled. Think yeah. of that. Okay. <laughs> Except with a lot so more blood and death and destruction. Don't think about cartoon characters getting impaled. <laughs> as you guys song can think about Olaf. As you guys know, this is gonna be a very exciting episode and we're very energetic, so let's uh go to the details. So today we are remembering and we all know about Dracula by the inspiration of uh, Bram Stoker's uh, infamous Prince of Darkness, that movie, the um, old... Uh, I don't remember what decade was that in. The first movie that Dracula was de- depicted. The it was the black movie? and white. I, that yes. was... It was 40s, The Prince 30s? of Darkness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was supposed to say, no, Dracula was 20s. Yeah, that uh, really depicts the Dracula, you know, with the two big teeth in front of his mouth, the, the black fangs, cape, the, the fangs. Turning yeah. the bat and missing a lot. And living in coffin. That's where that uh, 
came into our pop culture. So we mostly know of that name from the specific movie of uh, Bram Stoker. I've understood that, like, I get the whole no sunlight thing. Live underground with a mattress. I don't get it. Ignore well, Twilight. Well, that's good uh, imagination. That's how I will call I it. I cannot believe you just mentioned Twilight. <laughs> Don't worry about it. That's pretty sad, Chris. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so today we're going to discover the uh, gruesome history of Vlad, uh, Dracula. So we're going to start with the formative years. And uh, most of um, our research for today's episode has come from various sources, including that of Biographics channel from YouTube. So we'll be using a lot of their uh, um, <coughs> sources on that. So let's talk about the formative years, the beginning of the story and how Vlad came to be who he is so if yes, i'm correct he was a royal prince meant to be taught throughout his life ability kindness and all that not quite the plan <laughs> he was <laughs> you're, you're you're absolutely right so um vlad the third dracula that was his name he is to be the future prince of Wallachia. Wallachia is in uh it's a state in romania so he was born in 1431, and we know that that was the prominent time of the Ottoman Empire. Constantinople had fallen at that time, so the Ottoman Empire was expanding to the West and into Europe. His father, uh, Vlad II, doesn't that make sense? He's the third and his father is the second. That's pretty cool how that works. It's yes, that's Vlad how genealogy works. Evan. He's called <laughs> Vlad the Third. That's so yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so his father was the ruler of Wallachia, of course. And uh, when uh, Vlad was born, um, his father was inducted into the Order of the Dragon. And he got the surname Dracu, which uh, in um, ancient Romanian means dragon, but in today's Romanian means the devil. Coincidence? I mean, it's almost the same imagery anyways yes it's yes. it, it both very intimidating things anyways just saying order of the dragon sounds so much like a video game it's it so band name called it it sounds <laughs> like a dark souls place well their main goal was to um defend christianity against the ottoman turks so that was the main goal of the order of the and dragon they were islamic at the time correct or they were the, the Ottomans the Turks, were, yes. Yes. Ottomans, yeah. The Ottomans were Islamic, yes. So they, uh, the Order of the Dragon and all over Romania and Europe, they tried to defend Christianity at that point because the Ottomans are expanding at incredible rates. So his surname now is Dracul, uh, Vlad's father. So he is given the name of son of Dracul or Dracula. <laughs> so we kind of know how, we got, uh, how he got that name. And uh, sources, of course, inform us that since he was a kid, he was a very, uh, he very well loved family and values and name and honor. He was a very pro proponent of those ideas. And his goal, of course, you can think of his father, was to push his country's boundaries and expand his country. So that was his goal from a, from a, from a uh, young lad. That's what uh, his father was pu pushing him to do. So, when it comes to mother, we do not know who his mother was. Because at that time, his father had a lot of concubines and... He was married at one point, but because of that, it kind of... A, hey, it's probably one of these people. Yeah, there were a bunch. He was testing his options. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, anybody could be Vlad's mother at that point. Because they don't know. So, so he, he spent his formative years in Romania. And uh, his father got the throne of Wallachia in 1436. And... He's, he, um, he brought Vlad and his younger brother Radu to live in the royal capital of uh, Targovitz. And uh, of course, at that time, you know, like every royalty family, the boys will have been educated in Greek, Roman studies, and uh, the old philosophers. Exactly, and mostly Constantinople and Christianity and uh, the Bible and. Uh, whatever they had at that time, including mathematics, geography, science, languages, or the old church, and the languages at that time were Slavonic, German, and Latin, you know, all that classical um, knowledge. And um, all of that privileged upbringing was interrupted when their father was um, 
challenged by a rival group, the Hungarians. And everything goes uh, a little downhill from that point. J- just a little bit. Kind of like plane dropping out of the sky. <laughs> I like the imagery. Not personally, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vlad the Senior, his father, in uh, to go uh, against the Hungarians and support his territory, uh, s- creates an alliance with the Ottomans. To help him uh, regain his throne. Because uh, at that point I think the Hungarians <coughs> just took over. And so he made their alliance with the Ottomans to get uh, back his throne. And uh, the Sultan at that time was uh, Mehmed II. And Mehmed um, told Vlad Sr. that his two sons had to remain in the Ottoman court. In order to guarantee his loyalty, so he, Vlad the Senior had to leave his two his two boys to be educated by the Sultan at the Ottomans at the Ottomans court. A hostage situation. Uh, what's it called? Uh, an ultimatum. You disobey us. They did. I won't say that because um, it wasn't like a hostage uh, situation back then. I think it was the n- kind of like uh, the it ideal. It was normal for it was that normal. to happen. Yes. They're just say, like, oh, I guess I'll just leave my kids with my enemy. It's fine. It, it's not the enemy because you just created an well, alliance. Enemy, but enemy. But France did it all the time with Frenemy, England. Frenemy, I guess. And the Sultan at that time and throughout time, and I know from Greek history, uh, young Greek boys will go to the court of the Sultan to be educated because that was the only way you could get educated at that, at that time. But that's not the case with them because they're, of course, aristocracy so the boys moving into the court they learn the Turkish uh, language and religion is Islam and um, they were getting a different education they were learning the Quran uh, they were that's where they taught warfare and uh, that's where they taught how to be soldiers and um, Radu the younger brother actually accepted the life and embraced uh, the word of the Quran and he converted to Islam and entered uh, into serving the Ottoman court. But Vlad, however... Um, Took a different route. Yeah, he hated the Ottomans. He hated Islam. He was a great proponent. He tried to rebel at every single opportunity. He Ex- never settled down, I guess the best way to put it. Yeah, and he always got punishment for that. He was always punished because he will not follow his brother's uh, lead. So, with the assistance of the Turks, um, Vlad the Senior was able to regain his throne, but it didn't last for long. <laughs> That's a sad story. So in, in 1447, the Hungarians regained their army, and uh, they attacked Wallachia once more, and uh, Vlad the Senior was killed in the battlefield at that moment. I like to call this moment the snap. It was the snap. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> so, the next line to the throne, since the two kids are in the Ottoman court and he, their father is just dead, the next in line was actually their father's uh, brother, so their uncle, but he became a monk in a monastery, so he wasn't able to... He was unable to rule. Exactly, and he didn't want to rule at that time. I wouldn't want to rule if I was a monk. I'm safe, I have food, Especially I'm good. Especially if it's a kingdom where the leader has been deposed, killed... And then a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. And I wonder how much history would have changed if he wouldn't have become a monk. Uh, Their uncle would have become a monk. Yeah, we'll never know at that point. So, what that left was Vlad, 16 years old, to be the rightful heir. At 16. So, the Turks had grown fond of the teenager. They liked Vlad. They liked his character. And uh, they helped him, they wanted to help him regain his throne, which they did and they uh, took back they destroyed the rebel forces and took back the throne in 1448 just one year after uh, his father died as soon as the Ottomans uh, imposed Vlad on the throne, they left however, the Hungarians were still there waiting to snitch upon Vlad and take his throne back, so within two months Vlad was forced to leave his throne and his home and uh, flee to Moldova, or today's Moldova. 
why didn't he go back to Ot- Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire? I do not know that. I I'm think. I guess he still hated. Them. I mean, he probably still hated him, but like. <laughs> I yeah, think that's a that's a guess. <laughs> yeah. I think in Moldova, his uncle was there, because uh, he moved to get protection from his uncle that was the ruler of Moldova, Prince uh, Bogdan II. Yeah, I was about to say yeah. it starts with a B. Yeah, Bogdan. Bogdan, however, was assassinated in 1451, a few years after that happened. And uh, Vlad again had to leave this time. He had to book it. <laughs> exactly, he had to book it out of there. <laughs> this time... Uh, well, this kid's getting us traveling. Fla- <laughs> Vlad fled with his cousin, Prince Stephen, Bogdan the second son, and they ended up in Transylvania, where they came under the mentorship of a Hungarian warrior um and were fe- that was uh, fiercely opposed to the Ottoman Empire so Vlad with the help now of the Hungarian warrior uh took back his throne that belonged to him wait just the uh, Hungarian warrior and him or? no they had the the Hungarian oh, lords man, they were the leader. I was like the leader. What? Yeah, yes yeah, I, I was like what they actually gathered people from Moldova, uh, some from Hungary. That's later on. Oh. That's the second fight, yeah. So in the same that year, <coughs> in the same year, uh, 1453, the um, holy city, the holy Roman city of um, Constantinople fell to the Ottomans, 1453. And now it appeared, as I said in the beginning of our podcast, that the whole Europe now was open for the Ottomans to take. So, securing for Vlad Wallachia, his country, was even more important than ever at that moment. So, in uh, 1456, Vlad led uh, an army into Wallachia, and he met the army of Vladislav III, and they, um, which he was able to kill in the battlefield with a hand-to-hand combat. So, when Vladislav died, and Vladislav was the one that owned his, uh, <coughs> his uh, country... Uh, Vlad was restored to power and became the again the ruler of Wallachia. You'll see a lot of up and downs again. Side note: Do we ever find out which what was a king, emperor, just random? Thought. I believe it was just a ruler. I am not sure. He random thought. People will have called him king at that moment or just the lu- the ruler. He basically owned the property, which was the land. It was his property. So over the next six years, they will be. A bloodlust. Oh, that's putting it mildly. I believe at one point he killed in like a few weeks, was it? Like upward of 21,000 people. Yep, and we'll get to that. And how he did it, that's the important part. It's not just the death. People kill all the time. We have a lot of history. This is bonkers. It's how he did it, which is awesome. (coughs) Awesome in a historical perspective. (laughs) Don't get me confused here. (laughs) <laughs> uh, Evan, you advocate several kinds of murder. Wow. So in one podcast. I'm so over the next six, year, six years again, he will rule with uh, a bloodlust, and there's a, that's where he gets all of his name, he, all, the, all of what he did that will s- cement his name the forever. The Dracula reputation. Exactly. So the tortures. Let's move into the fun part of this podcast, because I know you all audiences came here today just to listen for the tortures. Who wants to learn? It's all about the murder. Just to listen for the tortures. (laughs) Just wait. (laughs) A lot of quotes (laughs) from Evan. So, having secured the throne for Wallachia, um, he uh, secured the border with all of his army and his cousin, Stephen, in order um, to secure their borders, but also he helped Stephen gain his throne of Moldova again, which they did, and they grew very strong together. When that was was accomplished... um, they were s- they were the only thing that was holding the Turks from breaking into the area. They were really strong in defending their land. So Vlad, remembering his young years back at the Ottoman Empire, wants to get revenge. He doesn't like them. He doesn't like the Ottomans. He doesn't like Islam. He sends out spies throughout the empire to go to find names of nobles. That's the first step. That betrayed his father. May I just say this was his own empire. Exactly. In his own empire. He sent spies in his own empire to go find the people, the monarchs, and yeah. the rich people, the rulers that betrayed his and father. And fight them to a 
last, I mean, nice dinner. Mm. So they invite him exactly at the dinner. And when they entered the doors, they were arrested. The older among them were all impaled instantly in front of their families, where those that were younger were forced into slavery, and they actually rebuilt Vlad's castle. Yeah, when I said the snap earlier, I wasn't kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when they finished the castle, they were there. They were then impaled. Isn't that a great leader here? <laughs> hey, thank you for building my castle. Get impaled, please. Everybody gets impaled. Girl. Get impaled. <laughs> it's like your 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 reward. You have this very sharp seat. It's like get this bread, but it's like <laughs> get impaled. It's like let's get impaled. Everybody, you get impaled. You get impaled. Older, younger, everybody. Oprah Winfrey of impaling. <laughs> <laughs> Vlad's so- treatment of those uh, that first uh, betrayed his father was just a build stone. Was just a cornerstone. That's what it all started next in his plan was to enforce his own moral code to his population and that came with tremendous amounts of cruelty the thing only great leaders do towards women and exactly thank you for bringing that bethany because i'm going to that right now what was his targeting towards women probably because uh he didn't have he a mother had mommy issues yeah i was gonna say he didn't have a mother really maybe and maybe religion i think he was a very just uh <laughs> was he was extreme <laughs> he was too extreme with all of his ideas and with his religion so when bethany mentioned uh females so he <laughs> appeared to have uh he was very concerned with female chastity so any woman who lost her virginity prior to marriage, and I'm sorry for the audience that will hear this, this is pretty cruel here, or who defiled the marriage bed will be impaled with the insertion point being the female genitalia. More often than not, the breast will also be cut off with the men with whom they had committed fornication being forced to eat them. Let's not unpack that. <laughs> yes. There's For no f- once, let's let history be what it is. There's no let's further just mention it and then there's move on. There's no further comment on that. But there's the second part. Uh-oh. Vlad also hated beggars and poor people. Oh, my gosh. All oh right? Boy. So he thought of them as they, they were existing off the hard work of others. So... One night, I guess, he decided to invite all the beggars in Wallachia to a massive feast in in a wooden hall. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's pretty nice of him, uh, right? He's yeah. a great guy. So once they had eaten, they, you know, they were all full with their bellies up. They were drinking, eating. They were like, oh, yeah, this Vlad guy. He's I love this guy. Great. Right? I love him. I haven't right? had a full Does meal in a while. Does it feel kind of warm in here? <laughs> 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 so at that moment... He shuts the doors. He bolts the doors and sells the bidding of fire. Hey, at least he waited until the f- stomachs were full. At least, yeah, he gave them oh, something. Oh, yeah, he's such a nice guy. He's right? such a... <laughs> <laughs> and, Not really. And doing that, he had he, get rid of the poor people that he did not want in his country because he hated poverty. He thought poverty was something that you did not get, but you were. Imagine, Imagine you're this 1400s father and you're just like i can't put food on the table you've been working so you've been working hard so hard and you know your family and you are like you're really you're roughing it and you know you have your wife and your two kids and you're like oh and then all of a sudden you hear your your ruler is giving you free food and you're like oh you know what that can't hurt anybody and you go to this dinner and then you and get hurt kills you <laughs> And then you get hurt. In his defense, the food didn't hurt them, like you said. It was just the building. It still. <laughs> well, he said beggars. So I don't know if that includes all the poverty. Families can beg. At that Evan. is true. That is very true. <laughs> Especially at that time. Evan, yeah. I'm going to say this guy was not great on discrimination. Oh, no. Other people are working hard. They have a family. No, it's you have less money. Burnt. I doubt like, it was discriminatory. Yeah, How feel, dare you yeah, have I really less feel money? like they were like, I don't feel like he was like, oh, are you a beggar or do you have family? That is true. 
Well, let's continue because <laughs> we still have guy. we still have a lot of story to cover. So, there's a few years that he does that. He's being cruel. He's being um, torturous and treacherous. I just want to make sure the audience, we're not making any of this up. We are not. This is all true. <laughs> so, the ultimate threat, the ultimate threat, um, comes back in the forefront. So in 1460, uh, Pope Pius II um, held a congress in Italy asking for a new crusade to reclaim Constantinople and push the Ottomans back to the desert. Hopefully he wished. I'm not so sure he asked as more as he demanded, but... Well, yeah. he said he committed a congress, so I don't know what that in indicates. <laughs> The crusade so, was, um, they wanted it to last for three years, and it was led by Matthias Corvius, that uh, his father has been killed from an invasion of Serbia. So Matthias uh, made a tour from around Europe to find people that wanted to volunteer to take part in the crusade. The only leader, and you can imagine who that would be, that would give weapons and positive response was Vlad from Wallachia. So shocking. Well, we like yeah. we like well, like, yeah, so yeah. he was determined to hold his king, his kingdom safe from the Turks. So he formed that alliance with um, <laughs> with uh, Corvius against the Ottomans and to establish that crusade. The Ottomans at that time were aware that a secret um, crusade or something was being formed. The Sultan so, Mohammed Mehmed the, the Third now seized the advantage to capture the last independent Serbian city the Smederevo. During his campaign, uh, when Vlad, when Vlad now heard that uh, he attacked the last Serbian um, independent city, he wanted to, um, he was committed now to give the Ottomans a lesson that they will never forget. At this time, the Ottoman Empire was extended to Greece in uh, 1461, when uh, the rulers surrendered without putting up any defense, now both Corinth and the capital of Mistras were ruled by the Turks. So at this time, 1461, the Ottomans go into Greece and they take that. So they really focused on that southern part of uh, their um, campaign. Yeah. The so Sultan had, although his eyes on Wallachia, because he knew that Vlad was there, so he declared it to be part of the Ottoman Empire. He didn't even Wait. fight him. He was he just like, fight it. and that's the part of the Ottoman Empire. Wait, exactly. Just because Vlad was there, he's just like, eh. No, just ju for the land, the resources, no. also to stick it to him. He didn't thought that Vlad had the power to defend him. Oh. So he declared the land. And the Sultan Vlad sent envoys. He sent people to c tell Vlad this, and that's he did. when that he that's when he found out. Exactly. So he sent the envoys, and thank you, Caleb, to collect the tribute. Because uh, being part of the Ottoman Empire, you have to pay a tribute to the empire. The so amount was 10,000 at the currency of the time, along with 500 men. Which at the time is a lot for a country. Exactly. And the Sultan, though, had underestimated our friend's strength and power. And psychopathic. Exactly. Friend is a strong word. So, Chris, when the Sultan invo envoys refused to lift the turbans, which is the hat that the Ottomans used to wear at the time, as a sign of respect to Vlad, Vlad was so angry, so he had his guards drive nails through their turbans into their head, into their skulls. And just so we're clear, these are not like carpet, I'm talking, these things like a foot long nails. Like a, like a drywall nail. <laughs> <laughs> the Sultan now responded by sending more of his army across the across all the way up to Wallachia to seize those men and Vlad and take them back um, to him. So Vlad sent his forces to grab every Turk that, that could be found and they impaled them on a red hot stick. Terrible in every form. Yeah. So now, towards the end of 1461, uh, Vlad wrote to Sultan, informing him that he could not afford to pay the tribute, and he was willing to come to Constantinople to, ne to negotiate. <laughs> so, Sultan Mehmed was aware that Vlad had already aligned himself with the crusade, 
So he wanted to fakely invite uh, Vlad to Constantinople and kill him in the uh, castle. So he sent one of his general, one of his generals, along with uh, a thousand cavalry, a thousand people to go meet one guy, right? <laughs> to meet with Vlad. To be fair, this one dude has done a lot of murder. Exactly. I would do the same. With the intention of ambushing Vlad and killing him. But Vlad, our good friend, knew the plan and took his um, operation in his own and he actually ambushed the people that were going to ambush him. He ambushed the ambush. Exactly. Ambushception. <laughs> Vlad so. and his army attacked them and... Um, it, this is actually the first battle here. The my sources say that that attack was the first instance where gunpowder was used to a deadly effect. My oh. question is, cool. was it used like in our Wait, to a deadly just, effect? Yes, to a deadly effect. What was the first fireworks? Just, uh, it was one of probably one of the first known. Well, yes, uh, official battle, I guess. Yeah. Uh, my thing is, it was it used in our tradition like guns as we usually see them, or just explosions? There's barrels of gunpowder you just launch off a cliff and I boom. Met. I bet it was just I was going to say, it's probably just explosions. Yeah. So all the army, how many did we say? A, f a few thousand? I think so. Like, yeah. yeah. So they were all killed by one man. So only one survived from the Turkish uh, army. And the majority of them actually went through the impalement process. One of Vlad's favorites pastimes. And we're sure this guy oh, isn't really? actually Dracula, right? Yeah. So his blood yeah, was like now hot. He was pumping. His blood was pumping now. So Vlad took his army to the Danube uh, River and they attacked every single Ottoman that they could find between Bulgaria, Serbia, and the Black Sea. They will attack everybody that was Ottoman. Hey, so you can un process that information. That's a lot of people. Uh, he went in advance to fortify towns and cities and used uh, his skills in the Turkish uh, language to encourage the guards to open their gates. When that happened, because he was very convincing, his army will lead into the city, kill everybody, slaughter every Turkish man, woman, or child that could be found. Mm. And that's where Caleb told us uh, earlier that in a period of two weeks... His army, over an area of 500 miles, killed 23,000 people in two weeks. The fact that he's, he one of the, this is going to be a controversial statement. He's probably one of the most successful leaders of all time simply because of the capability that he had with the resources he had. Military leader. Yeah, military Yeah. Domestically, yeah, yeah not so much. But come to military, he was extremely successful. Not a good dude. I don't like him. But you gotta acknowledge that he was good at what he did. He he's was like tough. Na he's like Napoleon. He or was something. tough. Yeah. Uh, on those lines of leaders. He would just kill. Well, that, I just want to say it. he didn't have as much, like, like, he, his, what is the word I'm looking for? No, no, no. He had enough army and men, but his... Charisma? Uh, ammo? Oh. Ammunition? Capabilities. Like... The Turkish had a lot. They're, yeah, technologically. Like, they were advanced. But, but that was still... his land, though. He knew the area better right, than the Right, right, right. But that, that, that was his advantage. Like, the reason yeah. why um, America beat the British in the Revolution War, because they knew the area. And this is the same as that situation. Yeah, exactly. So, in February of 1462... Uh, in February Vlad. of uh, 1462, uh, Vlad uh, wrote a letter to Matthias Corvius, that was the leader of the... Uh, uh, crusade uh, explaining his accomplishments. I have killed peasant men and women, young and old. We killed 23,844 Turks without counting those we burned in homes of the Turks whose head were cut by our soldiers. Thus, your highness, you must know I have broken the peace. Pulling a little demon in there. So, oh. an outraged uh, sultan now ordered his grand vizier with 18,000 troops to destroy the port of Galekia. He was attacking. Official attack. Oh, really? Are they attacking? I didn't know that. Yes, Chris. So an outraged now sultan ordered his grand vizier with 18,000 troops to destroy the port of Galekia. Uh, Vlad met him along the way with 30,000 uh, troops. And the Turks were utterly defeated, to say the least, with only 8,000 surviving out of the 18. 
And didn't the um, Valachians only lose like 5,000 soldiers? They lost very minimum uh, amount. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have the exact number. Right. But yeah, that was, that's now, later on. Never mind. I have a question. Um, you said that Vlad's brother was in uh, the Ottoman Empire. I know that there's some cases where the family members of like a enemy, like they would be punished. Was oh the... wait, that's in the l- later of the story. Oh, he? <laughs> he he plays a big part. I don't know about this part actually. <laughs> he plays a big part. So that battle gave Vlad a heroic reputation throughout Europe. Even the Pope praised him because of that. Good job, dude. I p I never mind. Good job, you impaled it. So well, even though the Pope. Even the Pope praised him for that. And at the same time, his reputation <laughs> being the impaler king uh, intimidated the Turkish so much that everybody knew of him. And, ev- and, and, and actually, Ottoman families would flee Europe to move back to, the Ana- to Anatolia because they were afraid that Vlad would come and kill them. For perfectly good reasons. Exactly. I mean, he hated it. Any attention is good intention. Or any uh, at- attention is good intention. <laughs> so, Vlad was now so strong and so feared that the Sultan himself had to cancel his campaign in Greece and turn his attention to Vlad. He called him the Vlad problem. So, the it's Sultan. wrong. <laughs> the Sultan gathered an army of 150,000 with only one mission. To find and kill Vlad. It's a lot of people. Yeah. So, he had already promised, and now that's where the brother comes in. The Sultan had already promised the rulership of Wallachia to Vlad's younger brother, Radu. Mm. So, his younger brother is with the Sultan. And uh, he's expected to have an empire soon. So, with his brother as the head of the army now. Oh. They send him to kill and destroy Vlad. Vlad's force was about 30,000, so significantly lower. And he was hugely outnumbered, of course. And he had a f- really low number of weaponry and uh um, Yeah, as Bethany mentioned, the technological powder. advantage was yes. extreme on the Turkish yep. side. So he didn't have a lot of that. So he had, like, lenses and daggers and uh, stuff like that. When the Turks had the cannons, archers missiles, weaponry, they had everything. So, so despite this, Vlad was able to inflict major casualties, although uh, in, engaging in uh, gu- guerrilla fights. Hit, re- hit and run raids and stuff like that, while the Sultan's army was, you know, that stable, huge population in the middle of the field, for, for, for example. His attacks were effective, but altogether useless. They didn't... The amount of numbers they had, it was more of a bother than an actual threat. But the tactic worked, though, and uh, they tried, actually. Were, Vlad was so smart that he was se- he was sending men into the Sultan's army with bubonic plague. Oh. And the plague was spreading over the Sultan's men. Viral warfare 101. Exactly. That's viral warfare, but also bio... I don't know what's the name of that word. Bio... Uh. Uh, not chemical. So Biochemical warfare. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's, I think it's just chemical warfare. Yeah, just one form of it, at least. No, I think it is biochemical. Mm. Yeah. Well, he was sending sick men into the army and getting other people sick. That's the story out of that. At the so, end, Vlad's army was mu- was superior than the Turkish army. Yeah, that, that's such an advanced right? thought for yeah. his time. It is. <laughs> no, I've got to imagine, you're sick. I know, go cough on them. My ultimate weapon. So when they arrived to the castle, because that all, all that all was happening away from the castle, when they arrived at the castle, um, Vlad now has only twenty four thousand men. I don't know why, and uh, they were holding the bubonic a plague, the mountain probably, uh, re- refuge out- outside of the city. So he was encircled by the Turks and the Turkish army, and he. And his army in the castle was forced into starvation by the Turks because they were surrounded and starvation was a prominent a problem. Blockade. Exactly. So leaving his so army behind uh, in, the, in the mountains, he disguised himself and walked in directly into the Turkish army encampment 
to, in order to find out the strategy of how they had set their camp out, and he was planning on a surprise attack. Didn't he also learn that the uh, Sultan had his men staying their tent at night, so they'd be... Would, panic wouldn't yes, ensue. Yes. Exactly. Oh. There was a surprise attack because of the starvation that was happening in, in Vlad's like, encampment, and um, in about uh, an hour, 50,000 Turks were slaughtered at the cost of only 5,000 of Vlad's men. Forever tell us happened was... Um, at night, the Sultan had his men stay in the tents, so panic wouldn't ensue, so Vlad kind of just slaughtered all of them while they were asleep. From the north and the south. Exactly. Yeah. But the problem was that he missed the Sultan's tent. He went to the wrong tent. He mistook it. Exactly. Uh. So at daybreak, um, Vlad called off the attack, and his men uh, returned back to the mountains. When the Sultan actually uh, saw what happened in the morning, he was prepared to retreat back to... Um, All the way back, back to Constantinople. Exactly. Constantinople. Although some of his generals convinced him to that a success was waiting for them and uh, they will not go back until they get Vlad. Wait, the generals told this to the Sultan? Yes. That... that Wow. I think they were trying to convince him of it. <laughs> so the Turks found an, an abandoned city. And um, they actually found the remains of uh, 20,000 Turkish soldiers killed in previous conflicts impaled on stakes. So imagine walking into an empty it's city. It's an FNG. It's an FNG. <laughs> exactly. And, w and watching 20,000 people um, on stakes. Or as I will put it, a preview. Mm. And so at this side, the Sultan is said to have remarked, a man who had done such things is worth much. He praised him for killing 20,000 20, of it's his people. It's like, you're a terrible person, but you did some incredible things. Good job with that impaling. It's like, look at yeah. all this work he put into it. Wow, he's so <laughs> creative. So with nothing to do in the empty city, the Sultan installed Radu, Vlad's brother, as the new ruler of Wallachia. And then uh, returned back to his empire. So yeah. Vlad now is not the control. He's up in the mountains. He's with his with, with his army the in, in the there. mountains. He's a mountain man. Yes. The wolf man. <laughs> <laughs> so Ra Radu, Vlad's younger brother, took forces and circled Vlad's castle. Located outside the city. It's been said that Vlad's first wife was in the castle... And the legend, of course, goes that when uh, she saw the army uh, uh, down from her window, she vowed... I would rather sleep with the fishes. Apparently, at that moment, she just threw herself from the window and died. R.I.P. <laughs> this man's story is insane. Yeah. And at this point, uh, bef before we move into our most uh, interesting part, which is the betrayal, the betrayal and... Uh, the death of our uh, favorite Vlad. We would like to thank uh, WUPI 92.1 FM for hosting our podcast. And we wanted to let you know that WUPI is now available online, but also on the TuneIn app. So make sure you click the subscribe button and listen to Ampis and Press Cal's number one hit music station. If you want to keep up with uh, WUPI's and Ampis events and news, make sure you like their page on Facebook and Instagram. Also, if you want to find more about our podcast series and if you want to listen to any of our previous po podcasts, make sure to follow our podcast on SoundCloud and YouTube by simply searching History Hour Podcast and make sure you throw some likes at us. And we are back. And uh, thank you again for listening. And uh, today, again, we've been discovering <laughs> this very interesting story. Yes. So, no. question: Does this story beat Jim Cullen? We're gonna decide that at the end. Mm. So we have two parts left in this long story, and uh, this is the betrayal and the end of Vlad. So Radu now uh, set about to solidify his position in the empire. So Vlad made his way to Hungary, and he saw the military support of his ally Matthias Cornivus, you know, the uh, leader of the uh, yeah, yeah. previous cru crusade. So Matthias, it's kind of, it's quite the character ag again. So he initially appeared to give his support to Vlad, but 
he was secretly inspiring against him with the Ottomans. Mm. So he organized a plan to ambush Vlad and uh, taking him as his prisoner. The reason behind that is that um, his loyalty has changed and uh, actually his loyalty is debated for centuries. We don't know why he did it. And um, he wanted, the biggest idea goes, that he wanted the Holy Roman Emperor to know that... He wanted to become the, re the Emperor. Yeah. Well, he wanted to inform the Pope at that time that he wanted to end the hostilities with the Turks. Which would hopefully result in him becoming the exactly. Holy Emperor. Exactly. Yeah. Give him, like, uh, a sense of uh, wise. And yeah. Mm. So Vlad was captured and he was a prisoner in Hungary for four years. He was converted to Catholicism and he also got married again to King Matthias' cousin, Iona uh, Zvilagi. So you, we see, I think now he was a little soft with his attitude. Um, the, they were a little soft when they had him as a prisoner. His attitude went from murder, murder, murder to stay alive. Well, they also even let him get married. Exactly. That, so that, exactly. that yeah. attitude was soft because Matthias allowed him to marry. And uh, apparently he was released prior to the ceremony, to his wedding ceremony. And now Vlad and his new wife were, were, were given a house in Pest. Weren't they, wasn't he under like house arrest, essentially? Exactly. He was under strict instruction of Quote not unquote, returning to Wallachia. He could not return to Wallachia. That was the deal. That was the only deal he could go anywhere else besides Wallachia. But Vlad Went to. wasn't going to give up his crown to his mm. uh, unroyal and unbrotherly uh, brother that he had. So he secretly collaborated with a former military commander of his. And they managed to gather a small army. Or with a mixture, and that goes back to Bethany's uh, comment, of mixture of Hungarian, Transylvanian, Wallachian, and Moldovian forces. Very diverse group of uh, soldiers. And he set out in uh, the middle of 1476. By now, it's a few years that have gone by. Again, he's a four years as a uh, prisoner, and then there's a few more years that he got married and he moved away. But now his young brother, Radu, died he wasn't he wasn't actually able to fight his brother but he was replaced by prince bazarb the elder mm. so before vlad um got to uh the battlefield to face bazarb and his army um, so before vlad even got to wallachia bazarb and his army fled so vlad took the throne and uh the army was dissolved so he was back in power, he was strong, but he was lacking a strong army. He was lacking the forces. So he wasn't strong. <laughs> exactly. He was strong physically, though, and mentally, because he got back his throne. And he only had 4,000 men. Did That's it. W wait, was his wife with him? The wife that he married in... Uh... I do not know that, but I am not sure. Okay. Probably. That is I, I imagine so, but I was just Isn't wondering. that what happened back then, you know, if the emperor goes... No, I feel like they left their wives... Out. They were just kind of like, you stay here. I'll go get the country. You. But now he has the country. He has the palace. So probably his right, wife will have moved like, in. Right, but like, well, like yeah. after the fact. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when the Turks returned two months after Vlad reclaimed re the throne, um, he was defeated again. Because his army wasn't strong. And he was defeated. And he was sad. He got nothing to impale. It's a actually... True defeat. Defeat impaled his heart. Exactly. And we actually forgot to mention that while being prisoner in Hungary, in Hungary, because that much passion for impaling, he was impaling rats and bats and other... Seriously, he's kind of psychopath. It's like animals. a drug. Exactly. <laughs> he's it, psychotic. He, he was psychotic on it. Yeah. And we forgot to mention that was pretty important. So last part of the story that came across. Yeah, <laughs> the end of them. So 
the exact details surrounding Vlad's death are debatable. Most uh, scholars agree that he was fighting, that he was killed while fighting the Turks in uh, 1477. But some Turkish uh, scholars recorded that the Turks killed and decapitated him, sending his head back to Constantinople, where it was preserved in a honey jar and displayed so that everybody could see that they, the vicious impaler was finally dead. They defeated the devil. Yes. Cool. The cool. dragon. So it is estimated that Vlad's legacy of execution moral included around 20,000 impalements, 5,000 beheadings, 10,000 burnings at the stake, and 10 Turks who had nails driven through the turbans. <laughs> and at so, least... Uh, he who got around. Yeah. And at least one was boiled alive and then cannibalized. Oh. Naturally. So what a great resume, right? Comes from. I think we should try to reconstruct his resume. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> so hire me or else. I don't know it is it's, really cool. I don't know if it's just me, but this sounds like a Greek tragedy tale. Yeah. Kinda. Except except he wasn't the hero, obviously. He was the and now he was that, the hero for his own story. And now that's where our episode comes to So is it the Joker? Yeah. And that's where our episode again comes into play now, because for the Ottomans, he was that great evil. And of course, for some of his people, he was a great evil. But for a great majority in Romania, Vlad is seen as a hero even today, because he's an important national figure. He kept away the Turks. It was, yeah, a God fearing uh, man that stood up against the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, some of his biographies describe him as a national hero. He is. For Romania. For them. For yeah. some people, of course. It depends on how you see the story. My thing with him is, along the logic of, yes, he was most definitely psychotic, 100%. You also got to think of, like, what he lost in the beginning of his life. His country, over and over again. He had to run out. His father, his brother, in a sense. His mother So never... I completely understand why he snapped. Well, fair point. Then why he was I so... I wish we had the technology to, like, figure out, like... like more about his brain and like why like what caused him to be the way he was just don't do phrenology he doesn't work no i understand that <laughs> i'm just saying it's crazy it is to bring back to what i said earlier which story is both crazier and insane and somehow more fun this vlad story or jim cullen story i'll go with vlad but i'm gonna open the question back to you caleb so was Vlad, and I'm going to open the, the question for you guys too. So was Vlad a hero for, def for defending his nation or a villain for his barbaric acts? A villain for his barbaric acts. Okay, Bethany is very short on that. Okay. I am in the middle. I think <coughs> that it depends on the perspective on who looks it. Like, what's, so what's, I would, what's, what, what's your perspective? I think he was a hero for his own people. I don't think he was a hero for everyone. <laughs> okay. I have to think he's a villain because, I mean, even his people, he tortured horribly. People who, uh, out of mar marital affair affairs, were, as we discussed, not going to mention again, horribly killed. Well, he didn't even mention just marital affairs. He said any woman who had premarital sex, that could... Oh, can I say... They, like, that doesn't say, like... Oh, if they m tried to do that or if they planned on doing that, it's just if. If you did it, yeah. you, you gone. So there Bye. Was, there was no <laughs> like serious stipulation. And he clearly had no problem murdering. My thing is, I wonder if he re not regretted it because that's clearly not true. If he enjoyed it, if he was like, I oh, hate that I have to do. Definitely did. This. No, no, he definitely enjoyed it. We have the records of that. Like, I mean, he was Question impaling answer, rats he was and stuff. Definitely a psychopath. He was impaling rats when he was in prison because he couldn't impale humans. I would definitely call him a villain. Yeah, just the simple way he was actually like going about killing people. Like he had, like he thought this through. Oh, he did. Of for sure. Of course, and that's why the legend comes today that I he was that. One day to look him in the eyes, just see if you could see anything there. Not in the spirit zone. I'm talking. Do you see crazy? I don't want to say we'll crazy, but do you see... We'll never know. Do you see the, law, the lack of humanity? 
I mean, I made the comparison earlier to him and Napoleon. I mean, he, they're almost the same people. Well, kind of. He didn't want to expand his empire. He wanted to keep his empire. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. That's the difference. That's the only, that's the only difference I, I can see. I can't really blame him for that part. I thought you were talking about in height, Chris. I was like, no. I wonder how tall he is. Did he have that complex? I don't think I, we do have that. <laughs> I don't know how tall uh, uh, Vlad was. Napoleon how, was, what, 5'8"? No, he was actually a normal height for today's for the standards. the time, yeah. Or, 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 uh, that for, uh, did, yeah. That era. Well, next time, we can talk about Napoleon for a later episode. <laughs> but, so, I guess, uh, for everybody that's listening now, the question is up to you. Do you think Vlad the Impaler or Vlad the Dracula is tyrant or a hero? And we would love to... Um, Hear your comments if you want to go to YouTube or SoundCloud and uh, comment on our videos. Or also if you want to give us a call uh, here at the, at the radio station. And we will be in touch with you if you give us some comments about that. But, so where do we stand, guys? Tyrant or hero? I think we kind of mentioned it. Tyrant. Um, tyrant. <laughs> Complete tyrant. Three tyrants. I'm going to remain neutral because I can. And I'm going to say that he's a troubled young man. Cheater. <laughs> Silence in the crowd. Yeah, that's <laughs> an understatement. His story is one worth remembering. They're both the price of the price of arrogance, the value of humility, and because it's amazing to hear. Absolutely. And what develops after that is and, bizarre. And for his military genius. Exactly. Yeah. As yeah. more like... Not a good person not at a good all, person. <laughs> but like militarily, he was a genius. Mm-hmm. That he yeah. was, and for his, of course, what developed later, you know, with the movie and the Dracula that comes alive and the vampires blah, blah, blah. and all that kind of stuff. But um, well, that's all for today's episode of the History Hour. Uh, join us again next week when we talk about the uh, native tribes of New England, and make sure you tune into WUPI ninety two point one FM next Saturday at four PM, so you never miss an episode. Also, for previous or future episodes of the History Hour podcast, we are now available on both SoundCloud and YouTube. So make sure you search and like our History Hour podcast pages by simply searching History Hour podcast. Thank you, and until next time. Bye-bye. Don't get impaled, please.